<laughs> can we uh, can we swear here? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you may. You don't you have to wear F? pants, you, but you may swear. It's, uh, it's also <laughs> encouraged. Perfect. Yeah, uh, cocktails are encouraged if you want. I haven't one. worn pants in a week. <laughs> On the flight deck, crews are now manning for the next launch. Time to clear the flight deck and catwalks. Stand well clear of all jet blasts, prop arcs, and exhaust. Time to start up the go aircraft. Let's start them up. Hi, I'm Dave Baronic, call sign Bio. I was an F-14 Rio and a Top Gun instructor, and I'm one of your co-hosts for the F-14 Tomcast. We all know a Navy Tomcat squadron consisted of a few dozen officers, mostly pilots and Rios, and a couple hundred enlisted men who kept the jets in the air. Today, we're talking with a couple of former enlisted men to get a different perspective on the mighty Tomcat. Hey, and I'm Craig Snyder, call sign Crunch. I was an F-14 pilot and uh, also a Top Gun instructor as well, and I'm one of your co-hosts here on the F-14 Tomcast. Our guests today are Barry Shoemate and John Kovar, who were aviation electronics technicians, also known as ATs, and they were responsible for the F-14's radar and other avionics and weapon systems. Now, uh, all ratings are absolutely important when we're trying to get airplanes up in the sky, of course. But when it came, when I was a squadron maintenance officer, I realized the importance of the ATs. That they were critical to keeping the Tomcats fully mission capable and able to actually go forward and, uh, and do our mission successfully. Now, but for all their technical skill and professionalism, I know that these two guys are going to be very entertaining. So Barry and John, welcome to the F-14 Tomcast. Yeah, thanks, Crunch. Thanks, Bio. Happy to be here. I've been following the show since it started, and uh, I appreciate the invite. All right. Extra points for being a regular. <laughs> All right. So for both you guys, let's uh, start off with a lot of times we like to let our guests know where you guys are from, what's your background. Uh, so, you know, how'd you get started in in the Navy and, and how'd you end up in Tomcats? John, you want to go first? I guess I could. Um, I originally grew up in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, went, went to college my, uh, first year, uh, I got an A in varsity golf. That was, that was really good. So but anyway, um, I, um, I, I thought the Navy was going to be pretty good, you know, go see the world, you know, um, a, a friend of mine, the, um, a friend of mine's dad was in the Navy, man. He used to tell some pretty good stories and, um, and I was like, yeah, you know, that sounds a good thing. You know, I really wanted to go to college and it was a good deal. So I enlisted in the Navy in uh, 86, right around when the original Tomcat, um, Top Gun thing came out. So, yeah, that's when I came in, 86. Been a while. Been a while. Excellent. Excellent. And how about you, uh, Barry? So I'm from Richmond, Virginia, and graduated high school and went to college as a music major. And uh, realized quickly, I'm a guitar player, there's a guitar over there, and realized quickly that I didn't belong in music school. And so then I went to a uh, community college in Charlottesville and got half my college done and just realized I didn't have the discipline. So I went down and talked to the recruiter and uh, took the ASVAB and the recruiter said, what do you want to do? And I said, I I've always loved airplanes. I built models as a kid and watched, you know, of course, Top Gun. And, and I said to the recruiter, I said, I want to be one of those guys in the beginning of Top Gun that are on the flight deck running around in slow motion, taxiing the jets. <laughs> That looks pretty cool. And the recruiter looked, he said, you know, you did pretty well on your ASVAB. I think you'd be better off being an AT. And I didn't know, I was like, what is that? And he said, aviation electronics. And so I said, okay. And uh, I, I thought that'd be a good skill to have after, after the Navy. And so, so I signed up to be an AT and that's how I, I became an AT. The irony is that you wanted to be on the flight deck in slow motion. And yeah. so you became an AT and they gave you a speed handle, right? You mean a speed <laughs> handle? I, I used to say, uh, God bless my speed handle. Uh, and for, the, for those who don't know, you know, what, what tell, tell our audience, what's a speed handle? What do you use that for? Uh, to open the panels that the boxers are inside of the jet. And, and, and they had these things called tried airs that are uh, like Allen screws. And there's a million of them. To open a panel, you had to open up 50 of these tried air screws with a speed handle. And um, typically, there's one that was stripped, or the the uh, 
the washer on the back of it that kept it from being a piece of fod was out. So then you, you know, a five minute job would turn into a half an hour job because you'd have to replace the, the tried air. But that's what you use a speed handle for. So I went right. to avionics school, learning multimeters and O-scopes and electronics and advanced electronics. And then I got a speed handle. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and how about you, John? No, nah, same thing. Uh, when I went in, well, um, same thing when you go down the recruiter, they're always trying to push your push the nuke program, right? Yeah. So um, they're like, hey, you really need to go nuke. I'm like, no, not yeah, really. Just... You know, I'm like, no. So a friend of mine, his dad worked for an oil company, man, and he had a really nice house. And, um, and I know I wanted to work on airplanes. I was always fascinated with airplanes. But he was a fire controlman in Vietnam. And I'm like, well, this guy, he's like, you know, I did that. And I did some tour in Vietnam, but he started working for this oil company doing some maintenance on like the oil wells and stuff. And nice house, pool table, pool. I'm like, well, yeah, fire control sounds pretty good, you know. So they kind of told me what it was. It's weapon systems control, um, avionics and, you know, radar and stuff. So I'm like, sounds good. So same sounds thing exciting. With, yeah, yeah. it's exciting, you know, go work on, you know, go work on the flight deck, you know, so. It's not, you know, your typical, I, I knew I didn't want to be a sub guy. There's just no way. <laughs> and then the school of going to nuclear power, I was like, no, 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 no. Just like, I just liked aircraft and uh, wanted to be on a, a big boat that wouldn't sink, I guess. <laughs> you would say. So, yeah. Let's hope. Yeah. I got a funny, I got a, I got a, they, they try to push nuke on me as well at the MEP station where you get your job. You get to the MEP station, do your physical and you get your job and, and I already signed up to be AT and they're like, no, you got to go take the nuke test. I'm like, I don't want to take the nuke test. I don't want to be a nuke. Like, you got to take it. So I had to go take it and I just Christmas treat it. And I, I walked up at, like after five minutes, I got up and I walked out because I wanted to go back to Charlottesville and have fun with my friends. And, uh, but that wasn't the case. And then somebody came up to me and was like, you really took that, that test quick. I was like, yeah, it was easy. It was really easy. But I, I... <laughs> <laughs> well, how'd you do? I have no idea, and I don't care. Okay, I, well, I, 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 just like John, I didn't want to be in a submarine, and I, I wanted to be on working on airplanes. You ended up being an AT anyway. So, what squadrons yes. did you guys? Uh, so, Barry, let's start with you. What what squadrons are you in? Tomcat squadrons. So I started. Uh, I'll back up a little bit. When I went, to, I graduated from A school in Millington. Back then, all the the aviation technical schools were in Millington. Now they're in Pensacola. Um, so I went. I signed up for a six year hitch, and I went to A school, and then I went to the school called AFTA, which is, stands for Advanced First Term Avionics, which is like a three month follow on technical school, which gave you third class right out of there. So I went to VF one hundred one, and luckily, since I was a third class, I went right to the shop, and like if you were a E3 or below, you would go to the line shack or do some other kind of collateral duty for a couple of years. And then, so I went right to the shop. And that's where I met John. I was, it was in BF-101. And that was 92 to 94. And it was, uh, it was actually considered neutral duty. So it was basically shore duty, but we'd have to do boat debts to get the pilot. 101 was the, the rag. So we would. So, so was, that, was that normal or uh, that was kind of unusual, wasn't it? Because I remember from my squadron days, a lot of ATs and, and every rating a lot of them came right to our fleet squadron as their first tour. So going to the red yeah, was, was pretty nice. <laughs> and I, I had the dream sheet and I wrote down on the dream sheet. I'm from Richmond. I joined the Navy to see the world and I get stationed two hours away from my home. <laughs> but uh, so I had the dream sheet and I just I had no faith in, in the system. So I wrote Tomcats because of Top Gun, you know, there's the, the, the baddest jet in the Navy, in my opinion, Tomcats, Oceana, shore duty, just, not thinking that they would, anybody would look at it. I thought I was going to get a Point Magoo and be an AIMD or whatever, USS Never Dock. So I, uh, lo and behold, I got neutral duty at 101. And uh, the instructors at, at school were like, wow, you, you got pretty lucky. So I, I did get lucky and, and was able to finish my degree, what I, my bachelor's degree, when I was at 101. I was there for two years and I, I, I had half my college before I joined. And then I finished up going to Embry Riddle and get my degree. And then, uh, so left there and went to VF-84, uh, Hangar 200 there, um, right after they got off cruise and they were slated for decommissioning. And so we weren't attached. I was there for about a year, less than two years, but we, were, uh, we weren't attached to an air wing. So we just did some weird, odd things. Went to uh, 29 Palms to support a, a Marine exercise. And we all had to live like Marines. And, and these A-frame D-huts was absolutely miserable. Uh, 
And then uh, I went to Green Flag and Nellis, which is something we supported in VF-84. And then I left VF-84 right before they went down to Key West to film the movie Executive Decision ah. uh, with, with uh, Kurt Russell and Steven Seagal and that 747, whatever that was. And I went to 103. And I got to VF-103 right, right when they turned into the Jolly Rogers. And so they, uh, they were the sluggers. And so right when I got there, I was still a Jolly Roger because that was VF-84 or the, the Jolly Rogers. And then I got there and uh, started work up cycle with Enterprise. And then I was one of the first guys to, to work with the engineers on the Lantern system. And I, I know one of the episodes previous was the Lantern. And so I was went up the Pax River instead of going to Comp 2X. I was asked to do that. And, and that was, took me about a millisecond to decide Pax River or the boat. I'm going to Pax River. So went to Pax River and then uh, cruised Enterprise in 96 and uh, and then left active duty uh, 97. Sounds good. John, what about you, your squadrons? Um, kind of the same thing when I got out of A school, same kind of thing. You put a dream sheet in. Um, I definitely wanted uh, fighters for sure. So I put Miramar and Oceana, but I also put Hornets. I think they were out of Cecil. So luckily I got stationed here. Um, I actually... When I got, when we, I went to Framp, VF one hundred and one Framp. It was actually pretty good. So, I had like four months of school, which was really good. It was really good school because we go and being a, at that time, I was at AQ Fire Control, so we just learned the Aug nine, and it was really good with Aug nine, Aug fifteen, pretty much. And uh, it, it was a good school, you know. I was in there. I was here. I was at Framp for like uh, four months. So we did a lot of signal flow, you know, PD, pulse, radar. And then we'd go out to the jet. And it's really good. Like, okay, here's how you change an antenna. Here's what the antenna is doing. Here's what the receiver's doing, uh, you know, and all that. That's, so that was pretty good. So my first squadron is the Top Hatters, VF-14. Um, loved it. Um, I was TAD for a little while, for only about like four months or so. Um, the way I got out of TAD early is I kind of was motivated. I, I would go down and work on my off time in the shop. And those guys kind of saw that I was kind of motivated. And sometimes you got to be careful what you ask for. We're on the boat and um, we, we uh, were um, only had one shift. So I go there on night shift and I end up working like 15 hours. Little did I know that if you work night shift in a Tomcat squadron, that's like your normal shift, you know, that that's so, when all the work gets done. Is on the exactly. Night shift. You got to get the planes ready for, I mean, they need seven jets in the morning. You better have seven jets ready, you know, mm -hmm. and, and all that, you know, how that goes. So, um, my first deployment, believe it or not, I saw you had a swordsman. That's when the swordsman shot down those MiG 23s. Um, that what was, was that pretty, like 80, 89, 89, 89, 89, I 89. think that was my first deployment. And, and we, it was pretty interesting. I mean, we worked, um, did the workups for that, but we were ready, you know, the MMCO came down and, and they, we kind of knew it that we were going over to the med there and they told us, it's like, Hey man, if we're ever going to shoot a missile, it's going to be the next couple of days because we're going down there. And um, so believe it or not, we, uh, us and 32, we had to lead in the morning. I guess our guys, um, it, it made it look like a, a strike that was going in kind of. So in the morning, they didn't do anything. So they all came back and then 32 had to lead. And that's when they jumped those MiG 23s. But the, like the MMCO said, he goes, hey, you know, if we're going to shoot a missile. So it was kind of funny because I, I think we had four sparrows and four winders on every jet. That's 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 a lot of firepower there. And didn't you know the Phoenix? I guess it was just too much weight for bring back or anything. But that was my first deployment. You know, hit a lot of ports. Didn't have a lot of money. But ironically, we pull in the Haifa Israel five days after we shot down those MIGs, and some Israeli guy comes up to me with a picture of a thirty-two jet. I'm like, how does this guy know this? You know, they were all happy. And so that, that was good. That was a good cruise. So then my next cruise is ends up being uh, Desert Storm or actually Desert Shield to start off with. That was a long cruise around Kennedy. And uh, when he invaded, I remember because it was like a no notice. We were kind of like the ready carrier. So, you know, we got ready. We got everybody CQ'd and we went out and it was seven and a half months. And we I think we left in August and then January 17th. Um, we, we launched the strikes into there. Um, that was, that was pretty good. So my first two deployments, you know, it was pretty active. 
so after that we get back and then I noticed that, you know, a lot of our guys were frustrated because sometimes the AWACS was controlling the guys and, and they would vector F 15s over and stuff. So we got back and that's when I went to one-on-one. So that's when we started bombing. So, you know, you go to maintenance meeting and okay, today we're going to bomb. Okay. What does that mean? We've been fighters the whole time. So, uh, that's when we started doing the, um, um, bombing, you know, the airplane had the wiring in it for the bombs, you know? So, um, yeah, that was, uh, 101 was a great tour. It's a lot of work. I was kind of like Barry. I actually uh, finished up my associate's degree there, but I was working, you know, we put some hours in, but the thing about, I liked about 101 is I was a young guy, had a lot of energy is you had, we had like 45 airplanes, and then we would have, you know, anywhere from like, I don't know, block 35s up to block 40s. We had a whole charade of aircraft and you learn so much. And then we would get guys in that were fleet guys from other squadrons. And we kind of pinged off each other to learn as much as we could about the jet. And of course, you know, the April Key West debt, you, you got to sign up early for that one. So do a lot of debts in, in, in 101. We did a lot of CQ debts, obviously Key West. And then a couple found deaths when we did a, a bombing death in there. So 101 was a good tour. After that, I went back to VF 14 because um, a couple of, there was a, there was a senior chief in maintenance kind of recruited me over there. So we built a pretty good squadron up there. It was um, that was around 94, 95. So I made a 97 deployment with the top hatters again. And uh, that's when we did have lantern. Uh, MVG cockpits. We could probably talk about that a little, little bit later. That was, um, that was, that was, there was a good deployment. Uh, we, we had a really great squadron there. We, we won the golden wrench and we had two Hornet squadrons and we won the golden wrench for three of the six months. So we, we just had a really wow. good squadron. That's really impressive. Good squadron. It was, it was good. That was what one of my, my favorite squadrons to be in the people that were in that squadron. It was just phenomenal. So lucky after that, I got picked up for uh, this EAP program. It was a good deal. So I actually uh, went to college for two years at ODU and got my um, uh, got my bachelor's degree. Hold on, what's and EAP? I forget. It was the end of this thing. It was called Enlisted Education Advancement Program. Okay. It, it was a really good deal. Not necessarily going to get a commission out of it, but it was uh, normally it was for people that to get an associate's, but I already had my associate's, so. It was a goal I set early on. So, um, so were you a college student full time, or were you still yeah. assigned to a squadron? No, I was a college student for two years. <laughs> so the skipper, well, XO put me in for it. It was Slapshot Carter was our XO, and uh, he, he was doing it. He, he interviewed me. And he goes, "Hey, you're going to get a non-observe foot rep. Are you all right with that?" And I'm like, "Well, sir." Um, for a year or two, for two years, and I said, "Yes, sir." Well, it's a goal I set. So. It was a good deal. So I, I did that, got my uh, bachelor's degree, and then I went to 102. That's when I 102. And then September 11th happened. We were scheduled to go out September 18th. So we were pretty much ready. We had one more plane that we were wrapping up a 224 day on, getting the seats back in. And we, we left September 18th, right after September 11th. So we spent 158 days at sea. Um, and we we dropped a lot of bombs, man. It was uh, it was uh, a lot of time at sea, man. But it was worth it. Right after September 11th, you know. So after what did I do after 102? Oh shoot, what did I do after? Wait, oh, that's where you growlers. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, I went to the um, super. Honest. I went to the fit team. Yeah. So I was on the transition team uh, for Oceana when they were. We actually stood up 106 from scratch. That was a good. That was a good tour. VFA one hundred six. Um, yes, they were getting rigged. Yeah. Yes, but I was on the F eighteen EF fit team, transition team. So we had to set up all the training. We had to get the tools, and uh, Fleet they we're going to try to. Team. It was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was good though. It was a lot of work. Um, but we stood up one hundred six. Got them safe for flight, and then I forget who the first squadron was that we transitioned. But we transitioned the first. Um, Tomcat squadron over getting their tools, air crew, you know, they, they were going through the syllabus and then, um, 
that was a good tour. That was a really good tour. And then um, what did I do after that? Yeah, and I got commissioned out of there as a, as a warrant. That that was good. And then after that, um, I, I was going to go to VF11. I interviewed and all that, and it was a good deal. I, I was always fighters, but my detailer, um, he's like, no, they, they like to take you out of your comfort zone. So I went out to Whidbey, which was – I didn't really want to go, but I, it was kind of one of – I'm kind of glad I did. So I went out there with me as a W two on a, in a Prowler squadron, and it was Grumman, you know. So that that was good. But then, so yeah, I went to uh, VAQ one thirty out of there. But then, um, that's when they were getting ready to transition to uh, Growlers. So since I had Super Hornet experience, uh, I I got um, sent over to VAQ one twenty nine and stood up as uh, I was AMO MMCO. Actually, started out as MMCO. Um, stood up the G rag from scratch. That was, that was good. We were getting brand new G's right out of the factory. And, um, we transitioned 129 over and then we tr- started transitioning the, uh, Prowler squadrons over. So that was a really good tour. I really enjoyed my tour as out would be. Oh, the um, G rag, the F 18 G rag. Okay. G 18 G growler. It's but basically a super rack warm- for that. Okay, sorry. I thought you said G oh, yeah. rack, and I was going, "What's a G rack?" Oh no, no, G rack. Right. I guess. Yeah, Crunch, so, I've been out of the picture for a long time, so you I probably know, know all that stuff. But it's like bio. <laughs> come on, keep up. Well, E eighteen G is a it's oh, yeah, a pretty E18G. capable platform. Yeah, that it's a pretty capable platform. I mean, you know, uh, snapshot of real time today. You know, being the end of March, we got stuff going on in Eastern Europe, and there. I mean, pretty sure there's airplanes over there. You know, yeah. we don't have fighters over there. We've got growlers over there, you know. Yeah, I saw stuff. that on the news. They sent, what, six right. of them over there, eight? Yeah, sure. Whatever you say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It. It was sure. the, it's on the open news. It's not it like I can see it. Yeah. 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 But, right. yeah, it was good. Brand new airplanes. It was a good tour. I, I really liked it. Met a lot of people. I, plus, the Pacific Northwest was was really good. So, then after that, I knew I was getting, getting ready to retire. So, I came back east to uh, did my uh, last sea tour was in VFA one uh, two thirteen um, Black Lines. That was that was good. Did appointment with them. Um, that was a really good tour. And then wrapped it up at one hundred six as a um, divo. It was a good tour. You know, it was really good. So back home in uh, Oceana, retired out of here. So that's pretty. It's a pretty long career there. Uh, <laughs> going in the wayback machine. Let's talk about when you guys first showed up. You know, you got out of A school. You were talking about like, hey, you know, a Top Gun generation. I want to go uh, go into a Tomcat squadron. You get there. You know, Barry, was it all that you hoped it would be? Uh, that much and more. I, I couldn't believe. I like when I got to the hangar. Was it hangar four hundred four, John? That was one hundred one, right? Uh huh. Yeah, that's um, right. And it's just walk in to the hangar and there's just, you're just surrounded by Tomcats and you're surrounded by pilots and maintenance guys. And, and it was just, it was unbelievable. And then going upstairs to check in and do all the admin stuff and to overhear pilots and Rios talking. And, uh, it was, it was almost surreal. And then, uh, and then I went out on the flight line with, with a guy for the first time and he, and he said, go sit in the back seat. I'm like, really? I can sit in the back seat of this thing. And he, it was uh, John, I remember Chuck Hewitt. Remember Chuck? Yeah, he was the first. So he sat in the back seat and, and, and showed me how to turn the, the AUG 9 on and showed me some things. And, uh, and and that was it. I mean, it was just the next thing I knew, you know. And so I, I went to the squadron before I went to Framp. So I was at the squadron like three or four months before I went to the school, which Framp is the school that teaches you avionics, F-14 avionics. So I knew John. And what John said was, was right on with guys who were, had been out in the fleet and done cruises, had a ton of corporate knowledge. And so John and I became friends. And I'm pretty sure it's because we both play guitar. And so we'd go out. <laughs> he plays better. <laughs> we, we'd work on jets and we just became fast friends and just would bullshit while we're working on jets. And then I just learned. And John was the guy who would pull the, the schematics out and not just, just shotgun things. And he would pull the schematics out. So I learned, I learned so much from John. But then when I got to the Framp school, I already I was way ahead of – where I should have been because most of those guys came from a school. So I knew they would, the, the teachers would put gripes on jets and I would knew what they, I, I knew what they did. So I would fix it immediately just because I had been on, working with John, you know, I was just a guy right out of a school. So I, I didn't know the jet. And so I just, I learned 
to work with guys who came back from a, a, a cruise or two who knew what was going on. And, and that's who I would, I, I would learn from. And, um, and a friend of mine, son is an AT in a helicopter squadron. And he asked for my advice. And I said, go find the, the guys in the shop who have the experience and, and follow those guys around because it'll help your career. That's good Sound advice. advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's real good advice. Absolutely. Well, it's like John said, he, he, when he was on TAD, he went and worked in the shop. So, and I told the same thing to this, my friend's son. So he's on TAD. He's at the line. And I'm like, go when, on your off time, go to the shop. And, uh, there'll be some guys who will tease you, but there'll be some guys who appreciate it. And, uh, don't worry about the guys who tease you. Well, that's one of those things where it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's easy to be, you know, it's kind of cool to, to be a slacker sometimes. Right. And yeah. so some people take that attitude, whereas the people who really take a strain and work hard, you know, they're the people who keep the, keep things moving forward. And that's awesome. So you bring up a great point, being a junior sailor in a squadron, you show up and if you're an E one, two or three, a lot of times you're going to go TAD first. You may not go right to the shop. As you get more experience and more time, TAD, you you get a chance to come back to the shop. Some of our listeners may not be familiar with the TAD process and what that means. And there, that looks like different things, whether you're back at Oceana or if you're out at sea and the numbers change and, and who goes and how long. Can one of you guys, uh, let's see, Barry, you were talking, John, can you talk us through uh, – through some, well, actually, Barry, you were probably a better person for this. It sounded like you were TAD a little bit more. Where, where no, actually, I, I, no, I, John was TAD. I was not John. TAD. I, I was a yeah. e, I was a E four, so I went right to the shop, yeah. which okay. benefited me. Yeah, John. So talk us talk us through the TAD. Matter of fact, as a when you were a, a you know a divo, you probably sent some guys TAD. You know all about it. So yeah, tell us. So, and, you're, you're right. And, probably, and, it does and, make and, a difference. Oh, sorry. And you're a you're a young new guy. You show up in a squadron. You're surrounded by F fourteens, or you show up at Oceana, and then they go. Okay, your job is. <laughs> yeah, I was first lieutenant for a little while after I've been through a year of school. Um, but and what's wife, first right? lieutenant do? What does that Just do? Cleaning up stuff, man. But like clean <laughs> you, the ready room. They but clean. It was, good, it was a good deal because I was done at twelve, and it's summertime in Virginia Beach, so I'm on the golf course at like one. So TED wasn't too bad for me. But you're right, Crunch. If you go to the boat, if you check into a squadron. And they're going to see, you're going to probably, the guys have to work in the galley. There's the command master chief, if you're not everybody, hopefully everybody on here knows what the command master chief is. But he works with the skipper and he's, he's in, uh, you got the maintenance master chief that's in charge of it. We call it heads, beds, and beds, beds and bombs. Master chief's, maintenance master chief's got the bombs. CMC's got the beds. So he's got all the people and he, and he has to send people TAD and then, Hey, fuel farms, you know, sometimes, Hey, the guy's got to go to fuel farms to run the trucks, you know, stuff like that. Or but the laundry you, or the galley or on the boat or at S five, you got to work the state rooms or exactly. you're doing, I mean, the tra somebody's got to work the trash room. Right. Exactly. And and I think it's important to remember that the, you know, the ship's company, the folks on a carrier, there's about what, 2000 people on a carrier. Yeah. And then the air wing shows up with, even more, 2,500, 3,000. And so guess what? The ship is not manned. They, you know, they, they can feed 5,000 people, but the, the ship doesn't run around with enough people to man the galley or the laundry for 5,000 because they only have 2,000. And then the air wing comes on and boom, the air wing's required to pull its own weight. And so we send folks on temporary duty to TAD and they come from the squadrons and, and <laughs> uh, all the other ride along commands. They got to pull their weight. Okay, it's, so like John said, though TAD on the ship and on the and on the base can be two mm. different things. And I remember when I was an XO of a VF two eleven at Oceana, in, uh, and we had some junior sailors who were TAD to various places on Oceana, and they were asking to extend their TAD. <laughs> and I, as soon as I mm. got that, I go negative. You get back <laughs> here because I go if somebody wants to do this thing, it must be a good deal. And, <laughs> No good deals. No. I mean, well, we, we were, yeah, I know. That's terrible. That sounds terrible, but we needed them, man. Yeah, and especially in a, you can use some bodies in a time. But uh, to um, um, pile on what Crunch was saying, and you get guys on the boat, you always, if you got a guy that was in the Chiefs mess, that was your hookup, man, because we would get good chow from the Chiefs mess. And they would, the Chiefs would, I mean, it's good. It's like you bring it up pizza night, you know, that was your hookup. Sometimes the war room, 
But, the, you know, after I got in there and having to pay my mess bill, I found out officers were cheaper than chiefs. So. <laughs> oh, I'll bet. oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, true. I always thought the chiefs true. mess was yeah, chief even mess better is than the money, water. man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I mean, but you had people like supply runners, you know, we had to have supply runners and, and stuff like that. So yeah, TAD is a, a, it's part of the business, you know, but like I said, I got fortunate. I didn't have to go that long. And, and I think a lot of that was, is I kind of volunteered and they, the shop supervisor kind of asked to get me there early. So yeah. that's good. Gotcha. Good. Gotcha. All right. Hey, cool. Crunch, can I throw in another background question? Talk about O level and I level. I love it. Let's do it. Who, who's better to talk? Oh, Barry, you, I don't know. Who's better to talk about that? The difference between O level and I level. I, I think we all know John's better, but I'll take a stab at it. Um, <laughs> so I level is uh, your work on the boxes, the actual electronics in the and, box. And so I stands doing for intermediate. Intermediate. Yep. Intermediate yep. level maintenance. Maintenance. And they work at AIMD or in the maintenance department of the ship, air conditioned, controlled environment. They get the boxes that we we give them. They fix them. You know, they do the electronics and the stuff we learn in A school. They really do. Um, and O level is organizational maintenance. Guys who work on the jets. And so I uh, not air condition. Always not, going out on the flight deck. Bad back, bad knees, <laughs> hot. Um, but when I was, you know, when I made that decision, because that that was a decision. I could have said on my dream sheet, which I talked about earlier. I level Oceana or whatever, but I, I just, I just thought I'm in the Navy. It needs to be exciting. I don't know how long I'm going to do this, but I'd like to climb around on the jets. And so, and we would still, John and I, would, we'd still figure out, I, we'd do eye level stuff to the, some boxes. We had, we had some tricks. Um, you, you were doing, you would, you're saying you would do eye level maintenance in the in the O level squadron shop. Is that what I just heard? A couple things, right, John? <laughs> you can't can't really tell you what that was. But you, you realize we're like, recording this, right? <laughs> what are they gonna do to me? We're not supposed to do that. But the, okay. Yeah, we, they, we do things we, like we, we just had there's a few little in, uh, idiosyncrasies of a few boxes that we knew it was pa- passed down by corporate knowledge. Instead of if a jet has to go, you don't want to take the time to go down to maintenance control and get another box or whatever. So like there's, and it wasn't a lot. It wasn't, yeah. we weren't always opening up boxes, but there's a few little tricks that uh, were, were passed down from our, our AT forefathers. Well, you know, you, when you've got guys in the shop who came from I level, you know, who came from AIMD aircraft intermediate maintenance division, you know, somewhere else on the base or on the ship, a lot of times they've had all of the experience working there and correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of times, the difference between I level and O level maintenance may not even be, you know, it's not the skill necessarily so much as having a test bench or the test equipment or access to the replacement parts, you know, cause you're basically doing warranty level work for right, actually, right. you're not even doing that. That's depot level in it. I mean, right, you're right, doing right. your, but you're, you're peeling the sticker off that says, do not remove this sticker. Right, right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's in between organizational level and depot level. Yeah. It's, it's now, trying to get those boxes back to the jet. Right. So organizational level, O level, squadron level is basically it for, I don't want to say it's plug and play, but it's remove this box, replace it with this one, which should work in general. Right. Is that a fair statement? Well, uh, it, I, I mean, it, John, it, no. I mean, a, a <laughs> lot of times but, but, yeah. in, th- in theory, in theory, in but theory. Uh, Excellent. with the Tomcat, with the Tomcat, I used to say that they, they built the wiring harnesses first and put the plane around the wiring harnesses because you just had <laughs> wires going everywhere. And the, the they had a box called the CSDC, which everything talked to. Um, and so it was you, computer we would signal to, data converter. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Um, but, but so there's, there's oftentimes you would change the two or three boxes that you were supposed to change and that wouldn't fix the gripe. So then you pull out the multimeter and you start searching for wires or, or you, you look at the pins and the cannon plugs to see that a pen's not bent or it's, it's broken off. And so it, it was in theory, yes. You know, you plug a, a, a bit test in, you change this box, but uh, yep. in the Tomcats, especially the A's and the B's, uh, the older jets, that, that wasn't necessarily always, always the case. Sure. Cause I know I remember times you guys would be start pulling out some, uh, you know, an air inlet computer or something like that. And you'd start being like, Hey, this thing's not working. There's something going on and maybe there's a ground, but you know, we'll get to that when you, I think you're going to ask me about the difference between Tomcats and Hornets. Oh, it yeah. is a, a TDR. 
and, and now and they are, it was it was very good at finding you know long you know six feet down the triax is shorted out you know mm-hmm. and uh yeah people forget about oh yeah it's just plug and play boxes but there's you know three thousand miles of wiring going to it and there's shielded yeah. pairs shielded eights and there there's i got a lot of stories on some yeah we have we have gripes from you know the the, the screens blank energies so yeah. that automatically was like a, a loose wire somewhere in a cannon plug going to that going to that box um and it wasn't always necessarily easy to find right and sometimes i know that there were times you'd look at um I, I've heard of times where you, you pull out a cannon plug and, you know, you take a look at that thing and one of those pins is just a little bit bent. And so yep. it just doesn't seat right. And then, of course, what some people don't realize is as you pull those boxes out, you know, that cannon plug, um, it needs a little bit of play. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like when you, you the power outlet behind your dryer, when you pull the dryer out, you know, you need the that thing to have a certain length of wire so that you can then you know, work behind your dryer and then you plug it into the wall and you push it back. Well, the, the wires going into those boxes were not built to actually pull the boxes out and be connected. I'm convinced because I would watch <laughs> you guys back there and you're trying to stick your hand in where you can't see it and connect that cannon plug and line everything up and then screw it in. And you've got like three inches of play and you're like, who's got the smallest hands yeah. over here? And God you know, forbid somebody change that cannon plug before you to make the cable even shorter, <laughs> which would happen. So. <laughs> Is that what happened too, right, John? Oh, the AUG 15, the, the two big plugs on there is a 115, 155 pin connectors. And like you said, the, the pin, you could set it up there and the pin would, if the lock was bad on it. So you get phantom gripes, you know, your OBCs, you know, you get an intermittent PSU acro, intermittent CI acro under G's. And then you seat it all up, you read the wires, you plug it back in, flies good five times and it comes back. So it's 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 got to knowing knowing the system and knowing knowing the wires, you know, and like here's an example. Of one that's kind of just came to my head is um, change a allow 93 for no scopes. OK, so I which one was allow 93? Allow 93 is your Phoenix station, station three and six. OK. And, you know, believe it or not, there was a 28 volt line that went from the circuit breaker panel back here. Aim 54 missile breaker. I just know it because it kicks butt. 28 volts went down to the rail, but it was taking out the bus. So now I'm not getting any power to my 601, 610, which is powering up your hand control unit, your TID, and your DDD. And this guy was troubleshooting it all night. And I said, hey, man, why don't you just try to pull the AIM-54 breaker? Turn it up. And, you know, it's good. I said, okay, well, one of these rails is bad. I mean, stuff like that, you just learn because you've seen it before, you know. It, just stuff like that. We had a uh, one time. That, it was, that was perfect. We're gonna have. <laughs> we gotta get some more of that stuff tonight. I got some that, more of that. Man. Man. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I hope the uh, Iranian of that, and they have those gripes. No, well, <laughs> Bill was on me with another one. If we talk about this wiring, the Iranian how, guy's like, "Oh, I know how to fix it now." <laughs> yeah, but here's a crazy one too. So, Bill, you know this guy. I wish we could get him on here. He's a Jackler. Yeah, yeah. This is my he's, he's my housemate. Guy, really awesome smart. guy. So we go out to. I think I was in 14 that day, and uh, we go out to go do a missile check. So we go up, sit, turn everything up, run bit four. Got to run class one OBC before we even start. You know, you got any problems? If they have okay, OBC rambles. is onboard checkout. Just right, and it's just a it's just an internal. Check. Oh yeah, I guess. You're right. And then you got to have an airspeed greater than 70. Wait, yeah, class one. So we turn it up. We turn the radar up and we're getting started to run the bit four. And there's there's no odd numbers. So you are a Rio, right, Bio? Yeah. So if you remember on sequence five, all your channels, there, there was no there was no odd numbers. It was all kinds of weird stuff going on. We're like, what is this? So. We changed we changed the computer the um, 451 that kind of brings your symbology up there. 461 is all your interface. So we're sitting here. It's like, what is this? So Bill's sitting on the side of the jet. And he goes, you know, man, I saw the airframers in here yesterday. They were up in the nose wheel well. This is a crazy story. So they were doing a TD, a technical directive, is where you're going to change something. Well, every time the nose gear came up, it was this is crazy how this ties into the radar. The nose gear would come up in the nose wheel well, and it was rubbing. So they put this plate on there, to, like a little plate to keep it from hitting on the side of the fuselage, actually like a bracket in there. 
So what they did is when they put that bracket in, they nobody looked on the other side and drilled into a, a disconnect, a, a 330 disconnect where all the wires were coming up from the computer. <laughs> and they drilled into this hundred and the disconnect, if you ever go, it's like you got to stand on the launch bar. And if you're sitting in the cockpit, it's like right on your right foot by your rudder. It was a it was a discon three thirty disconnect, and sure enough, we peeled it back, and there's the drill hole right through the whole <laughs> wire. <button. laughs> I mean, this is it, man. So now now we got this whole thing. We got to pull the connector out and just stuff like that, you know. Nice job figuring it out, but I know yeah. it's like stuff like that and Not- all the kinds of stuff that you learn that we used to pass down. You know, okay, yeah. just before we get too much further, because we've already started talking about this, I'm gonna we'll be showing the uh, pictures while we're uh, talking. We'll show a picture of Barry in the cockpit, and that's him okay. in the front seat, and and a picture of John standing by the uh, the open panel, and then John repairing after startup. I want to get those pictures because you guys gave them to us. Then we can just keep telling stories. Okay, thanks, awesome, uh, Barry. I think I cut you off though. Go ahead. Yeah, John was talking about the 451 was the computer for the symbology, uh, the AUG-9. And I remember when it was a VF-84, and there was a gripe, uh, Rio would say Chinese symbology. And I don't know if you remember this bio, but the, the TID just would have some weird yeah. symbology. And yeah. back in the 90s, we called it Chinese symbology. Yeah, but what it was was uh, like <laughs> multiple, multiple letters overlap. Like yeah, any- it was just weird. Yeah. Um, so we went out to, we were, we were troubleshooting the launch, which means there's a guy from every shop covering the launch. And if there's a problem with the system of that, the guy, you would troubleshoot it. And so I was working with this guy from 84 and he opened up the panel where the 451 was, took it out and dropped it on the ground from about two inches up a couple of times and then put it back in the jet. And then Rio goes, it's good. <laughs> so it's just receipt. He's receiving the circuit cards. So wait a minute. Was that on the ship? No, it was, it was at Oceana. This was at Oceana. Getting ready for the launch. Get, yeah, you go troubleshoot the launch. And, Jeez. you know, some, something happens. You go plug into the nose well well with your, your headset on and uh, talk to the pilot of the Rio and ask some questions to troubleshoot. And then, uh, but this guy did this and dropped it a couple times, not, you know, a couple inches off the ground, reseated the circuit cards, put it in. And the other maintainers looked, looked at him like he discovered fire. <laughs> it was just, and so that was a trick that I, and he was a fleet guy. And so I learned that, you know, and, uh, but the easiest way to fix it was just turn it off for a minute and turn it back on and then let oh, everything, yeah, re, yeah. Re, you know, or pull circuit breakers and push it back in. And hopefully that would work. And we used to, uh, I mean, in the back seat, we would do uh, control. Well, it's control all delete on our computer, but we would. The we hard would, reset. Yeah, hard, yeah. Hard reset. What was that, John? John knows. Yeah, the button one. That's how I could tell if it was a computer problem or if you get, the, yeah. what was it, the cross? The direct yeah, or oh, yeah, I can tell if you, yeah, the I could tell if you were getting if it was six hundred one six hundred one six six ten was your power, or if it was a computer problem that would kind of get us and then get you out of there. Try to get you to the cat. Rio <laughs> Adventures. <laughs> I got wow. a crazy one too. I fixed one one time. Is no scopes, kind of the same thing, but um, I don't know if the the uh, relay racks are y'all familiar? They're up on the above the intakes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a whole bunch of it's old technology, but they would stick. And I think it was K51 was the one that was on there. And uh, it powers your it would power the computers down there. And I would get I, one time I got up there and just started jumping up and down on the on the <laughs> on the intake there on the right glove relay rack and psh, scopes are up. Good to go. Go have a nice, you know. The, just little things like that, you know. What would it do? Just knock a knock a relay loose? Yeah, it sticking? It's just a relay sticking because they're electromechanical, and it was right. so it, it was just like wasn't enough voltage. It may not have just clicked, you know. It's just so stuff like that. Just little. So basically, you, you, it, it's it's just like the movie Flight of the Intruder, where he says in the manual it says to kick it. <laughs> <laughs> It's Grumman, it's right? It's like an, it is Grumman. That's right. Well, these uh, guys, the, the older jets, I remember they would start up and they had the daily doors around the engines open oh, when they'd start yeah, them up. Yeah. And it's, at VF84, we had old A's. And they'd start the jet up and the jet would morph. You know, it would literally morph a little bit so those doors couldn't close. So the guys would have to go back and put a jack yeah. in the back of the jet in between the nozzles 
under right, where the dump mast is and jack it up or shake it. There'd be like six guys shaking the jet to get those doors closed. It yeah. was just a lot of times that would happen. Like if you fueled the the jet with the with the doors open, they would not close again. Right. And so a lot of times you'd see guys back there. They would uh, you'd see a guy lie on his back. And he's put his feet up right up, right behind the ventral fin. Yeah, and he just started. Pushed up. I, I remember the first time I felt that. I was I was sitting there. I was a rag student. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what the hell is going on right now? This is not normal. And then welcome, to, somebody, welcome to naval aviation. That's right. Somebody's like, well, this is it. This, somebody fueled this airplane and bent it when the yep. door was open. Yep. Oh, funny, funny. Actually, that's a good point. With those daily doors, so on the engine, you had a daily door and a weekly door. I know this isn't the uh, AT land, but things you, they they would be so hard to close. The guys, you know, you they would come. You would have to just slam them shut. Yeah. And I always looked at that. I'm like, damn, if anybody's got a finger in there, they're losing yeah. it. You know, but you're that's what I was really glad oh. I was an AT when I would see that. I was like, okay, you guys got it. Yeah, I got oh, my yeah. speed handle. Man, I tell you, I was glad I knit. And, and I'm trying to think, you know, and every once in a while, we, you know, air crew, we'd be on the road cross country, and all of a sudden we got to open the deal. You're like, oh no, <laughs> oh no, now I got to figure out how to close this thing without a help, yeah. without help. You know, every once in a while, you get a jet though that smooth, you know, it's like that's it right, hasn't been bent. That's right, whatever. Yeah, that's it did happen, or maybe it had been bent so much that it was back to straight. <laughs> 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 so so did you guys like getting the cockpit called was that kind of fun or was it a pain or uh john were you ever front seat called no that, no, that wasn't either. the ats didn't but yeah we didn't really i mean it really wasn't a it was kind of a call but not really they we would go through and we, we basically when they do a low power uh we do a all shops turn and we would get back there and i would as the AT, you're running everything up. Plus, you got to run OBC to drop the ramps and all that, mm-hmm. and then just do a full systems check. Like I run the bird card, check all the fly catchers, and and if I run any fly catchers for the AEs. You usually had an AE mech or an airframer in the front seat on the drive. The bird card, yeah, you go out the there for a- crunch. You remember bird cards? I, I don't do. Know if you had a bit, <laughs> yeah, bit error report and bit was built in test, and it was one through eight, and they had all these number place to write down numbers or just put a check if it passed. So anyway, so you guys did that also. I mean, Rio's were supposed to run a Burkhardt on every flight. And I'd be guys- lying if I said I ever actually touched one, right? Oh, yeah. But I, I I saw them. I saw I don't think them. Pilots were allowed to touch them. Nope. No, no, no. no. This not is even allowed. To, I'm not even allowed to say Burkhardt. Yeah, <laughs> flycatcher. No, I'm not allowed to mention flycatchers or Burkhards or bit codes or anything. But that was fun like doing those low power turns. Like that was that was just being in the jet with the engines running and just running the radar. And I got a couple high power turns where they'd put put the big chain on the jet and they'd go to afterburner. Uh, and that was that was pretty pretty cool. Looking back at it. Oh yeah, that's a lot. Especially when it's nighttime out on the boat. Mm-hmm. Get get that jet into full a lot of faith in that train. <laughs> a lot of faith in that chain. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That is so true. Well, okay, so question for you guys you can you can be honest now because i i i I am retired now so you you won't hurt my feelings did you guys ever (laughs) did you guys ever play jokes on air crew Uh, we played jokes on everybody (laughs) um back then i don't know how it is now to be an at but we're relentless on everybody i mean god forbid a guy in your shop falls asleep and, you know, just does he wake no. up without an eyebrow? No, he wakes up. No, oh. I painted a, a. I took the white out and painted an L on the guy's left boot and an R on the right boot, and he walked around the ship a couple of days like just things like that, just stupid things. But air crew, uh, uh, if we had a particularly short short air crew member, they're walking out to the to get in the jet, we would maybe get up and lower the seat all the way down. And so you see, breaker. yeah, you see, you see the top of the helmet in the cockpit, and then a the middle finger, um, just, just things like that. And we just, uh, yeah, it was it's just what you did to to kind of maintain your sanity. And, and sometimes, and it was messing uh, with switches in the back seat or anything like that. No, nah, I never really did that because that just meant more work for me. Um, <laughs> I did. Uh, I don't. I don't ever ever told John the story, but we were. So when the jets flew the best is when you flew them all the time, like at the end of a cruise, they just, they wouldn't break. 
So a Tomcat you could fix on a Friday at Oceana and it would be in a hundred percent up jet. And you come back Monday to the same jet and it's got gripes. Yeah. I don't know why that is, but yeah. uh, when you, when you flew the shit out of them on a, on a cruise, they would just, they would just work. Am I right, John? Oh, yeah. You said to keep flying them. So at the end of my cruise, we were, uh, the jets are coming back and you see, you look at the both cockpits as a troubleshooter and then you get two thumbs up and they're like, Okay, good, good. And then you debrief them. It might be a up, a up gripe, some some kind of gripe that's not going to stop it. So I we just kept that up, up, up. And so I went to the maintenance chief, and I knew he was talking on the radio down to the the uh, maintenance master chief down at, at uh, maintenance control, who was an AT, and I knew that. So I went to the the guy on the flight deck, and I because you would call it for boxes if you had to change a box, you'd call it them, and they'd, your AT shop would bring a box, you change the box out. So I called down and I asked for the two weirdest things that you that would ne- didn't make any sense. And I won't, I don't remember what they were, but they're just the, the weirdest things you would ever ask for. Just to bust their chops. Just to just because I knew the AT. I knew the guy down there was a, a Master Chief AT. And then I was looking at the guy and he's called it on the radio because he was an AT. He didn't know what I was doing. And I just remember he's talking to me and he looks over at me. And I thought he was gonna kill me. <laughs> he's a huge guy. It's Vermilion. Do you remember Vermilion, John? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that guy was huge. But uh <laughs> just playing jet, yeah, it was just we were relentless. I'm sure John has stories. No, I didn't really mess with the air crew, but like you said, we had to, you had to have a thick skin in the shop because it was like you bust on people, you know, like we would get milk man of the day, man. You you're milking <laughs> that job out, you know, and it was like you yeah. you know, it was just like riddling, you know, uh riddling each other, you know, but not really air crew too much. But yeah. Mm. Hmm. Well, and stuff that we did do at the end of cruise and stuff. Now we probably can't hazing like squadron stuff. If you got, you probably don't. You probably bio the two line shacks would go at it. I don't know if you. You probably didn't know. You probably weren't briefed on that. But yeah, at the end of the <laughs> cruise, the squadrons. There was a lot of stuff going on. But yeah, not, you not know, too much you know, a, a lot of stuff. There, yeah, there are some different limits now. I mean, I I got out in 1999. But so I've been out a long time. And, but from from talking to recent pilots in Rio's, at least, there's a lot of similarities. There's some mm-hmm. limits and there's some different things, but there's a lot of similarities. So you guys say, I don't know if they still do that. I'll bet they do a lot of that stuff. Still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People are people. Probably. Young sailors are young sailors, yeah. you know. Crunch, you like like your <laughs> I, I I think you're spot on. I think that uh it is absolutely the same. Just it just it rhymes, it just sounds a little different. That's all. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> speaking well, speaking of good times and good stories, Barry, apparently you have a twenty nine palms debt that you have a story about. Let's hear about it. The twenty nine palms debt. Um are you talking about the, the F five? I don't know. You t- you were telling us about a BF eighty four debt, the twenty nine palms. Oh, oh, the twenty nine palms. So it was the twenty nine palms, uh, and they were like, "You guys are going to live like Marines out of boot camp," and we're like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> it's so okay. I got the story now. So the pilot, the air crew, and the maintainers both lived in A frame D huts, which was sand on the bottom. You had cots. You had a sea bag. There was no, it was miserable. It was absolutely miserable. MREs. Um, and so yeah. they said, they said, nobody's going out in town. And you only brought one pair of civilian clothes in case you had to go home, emergency leave. And so and we're, I think it was three weeks. It was just horrible. And so one of the weekends, one of our chiefs had a car and he's like, come on, we're going out in town. So we put our one set of uh, civilian clothes on, went out in town on Friday night. And then uh, had fun, didn't get in trouble. And then Saturday night, wore the same clothes because we only had one set. Went out in town, had some fun, didn't get in trouble. But then I guess the uh, the leadership found out about that. And uh, so we got kind of scolded. And they, I remember somebody saying, no more white hats out in town. So then a day later, I guess our pilots got in, fight with Marine, got in fights with the Marine pilots because it was all Marines. I mean, and this guys had black eyes because they were playing a – I don't know the, the pool ball game or I can't remember what it's called, but crud, you know, talk, crud. yeah. Crud. So, <laughs> so the night we're like, no more white house. And none of us had black eyes. You know, we didn't get in trouble, but uh, 
It was just funny. And that was, uh, I think the day before we were supposed to leave, a, a, a jet fought at an engine. So we had to stay there for a couple of days. And, oh. And, uh, and it was like, it was just, I mean, you take the trash out and there's a coyote between you and the trash can. And you just see the eyes of a coyote. And then the Marines would throw MRE bombs at you. So it was, uh, I think we were the only Navy squatter to go out there in 29 Palms. If I, if First I, and the last after that. Yeah, Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> CACs. The, the I, exercise was CACs. Oh, I flew That's over 29 Palms and I, I participated in CACs, but it was, yeah. we never landed there. We flew yeah. out of Miramar. It's like, the runway oh. moves. The runway moves. It was just this, these, pa- these, uh, yeah, tiles. aluminum matting or something like that. Yeah. 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 And the runway would move. And, uh, I think it's guys. a combined arms exercise, if I remember right. Is yes. Yes. And, and we did the air support for that in, uh, in 84 when we were trying hey, to survive for a little bit longer. You want to move on to, uh, the, comparison to the hornet and super hornet sure you think we're ready to do that sure um john yeah. that's your that's your yeah thing. so i forgot to tell you that when i when i did when i um got finished with my cruise in 102 i was still had some time so i actually went out to lamore and transit we transitioned over to f's out there i think we had a lot 23s and, and we had nine 23s and four 24s but anyway um I was a chief at the time, so I was going to be. The, we didn't have a lot of chiefs out there, so I double dipped uh, line and coordinator chief. And then I got. Um, then once I got safe for flight, I ran the desk. But when we went out there, we went to Super Fam, and uh, went over. Big difference, you know. It's it's a paradigm shift, and you know, as you get older, you know, you don't want to. You don't. You're kind of not thinking stuff's going to work all well. So we went through this whole I eat them thing. Cause like Barry said, I'm used to looking at the pubs, you know, I, fu- I can do a signal flow through and we have a block diagram, you know, you have a good visualization of what, what's going on. What does I eat them mean? Uh, interactive electronic, um, tac- um, tactical manual or uh, technical manual. So sorry, technical manual, and that's it's basically a computer. Is Which what is what the is. Hornet or super Hornet? Yes. Okay. So most it's, airplanes it's a, have it's a tough. It's a tough book, right? Tough book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Hardened okay. laptop. Exactly. Yeah. And that's how they would troubleshoot. You know, we go through there, but um, I'm like, this isn't going to work that well. You know. Um, so we we went through Super Fan. We started. We got our airplanes, and everybody's going through school and stuff. But just the ease of maintenance on a Super Hornet was just amazing to me compared to a Tomcat. It was because just, it, with a super hornet, it, it now really is plug and play. Yeah, you know, it tells you what box to remove. You swap it out, and you're done. Right? Yeah, exactly. But then those guys kind of got dependent on MSP codes, maintenance status panels up in the nose wheel well, and you would have, I don't know, you have to check it before they went to flight, to make sure there's not any uh, catastrophic ones on their down and gripes. But just the ease of maintenance of just popping panels out. You know, if they got a station gripe, say station two gripe. Um, we were pretty much, if we got a PSU acro, we were down in Tomcats, got to download, de-arm, check everything. They could just pull the breaker and, and, you know, have a good day with that. So changing an engine in that thing, you could change it in a shift. You know, and, you didn't, only, and you didn't have to do a Pro B afterwards. No, no Pro B. Yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. which, which for the crowd is a functional check flight where you'd get airborne and you do, you basically put the engine through the, the ringer to include mock runs and shutting it down, all sorts of stuff. And then you land and then you can load it up and send it on a mission. Whereas with a super Hornet, you don't have to, you can nope. just swap it out. You do basically a ground check where the, the FADEC just goes through a little self check and you go, yep, it's going to work. That's it. Yeah. FADEC. It's craziness. Yeah. It it's, it's very nice. It's the same What's thing the in FADEC? commercial aviation. Oh, yep. uh, what is FADEC stand for? Uh, um, it just tells what it is. Full authority, digital electronic control. Engine control. <laughs> Engine yeah, right. engine control. yeah that that's the the brains of the brains. engine. brains and i learned a lot about that because it also is controlling your vents your variable exhaust nozzles yeah. and believe it or not all that stuff in the tomcat all that stuff back aft all your nozzles and um was controlled by oil this is yeah. all controlled by fuel and then i mean you mentioned on pro b right yeah. Yeah. So it's just so much easier. And then pro B's, we don't, you don't hardly have a pro Bra- Bravo or pro Charlie. I'm sorry. Pro Charlie's of flight controls. Cause you, you can just take a trailing edge flap off of this airplane, put it on another rig it and, and you're good to go. The Tomcat, if, if you just yeah. adjusted a lollipop on a flight controls, it's automatic pro Charlie, which is 
you know, flight that, control check checklist. And it, fortunately, the pro C was very short. Right. It was. It, you could do it in about fifteen right. minutes, maybe. Didn't but we sometimes uh, do pro and goes even on yeah. deployment. We did, um, but, that, but it but would it be a pro C and go yeah, where yeah, it was yeah. like, hey, what did we do? Well, we swapped out this flight control. We're going to do a real quick check and then we'll go. And if you yeah. were down, you couldn't go. But I don't remember a pro A and a pro B were generally you know, yeah. not allowed to Dedicated pro and go. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. Matter of fact, I recall a certain squadron in one of my deployments where they weren't telling anybody and they did a pro and go and went in country and Somebody got in a lot of trouble from CAG. <laughs> I'll, I'll just end it there. But um, yeah. but yeah, so so it's it's funny because you talk about the Super Hornet with swapping out of flight controls. You trade, you know, swap out a trailing edge flap and put it in. And you just rig it. That's where you do the um, basically, you know, was you hold the switch on one side and hit a button on the other side, right? And it just makes every valve do this little switching valve thing. Is that right? Yeah, I can't. Yep. I can't remember exactly. This and it rolls familiar. up and checks the symmetry on it, makes sure they're all you know, ace, you know, symmetrical. Run a yeah. bit check on it, and it's all good to go. As long as yeah. you don't, as long as you don't take both um, flight FCCs out, you know. So. And then you got to do a check if you do that. Huh? Right. Oh, okay. But I everything guess else too. Everything is just so much simpler. I am glad to hear that. Open manufacturers, panels. manufacturers, Navy, everybody got smarter you know, as time went on. So, well, I have to say that, you know, as the Tomcat was aging, you know, the main, it got very maintenance intensive. And then I was the Mo, the maintenance officer for two thirteen on the very last deployment. And, you know, as Barry was saying that we flew those things nonstop. I mean, it was almost like we, we didn't shut them down. We wanted to just like hot fuel them because <laughs> they were just running. They were so good. And they were just, they were awesome. And we're like, holy cow, they're working now finally. And then right about then was the F-18Cs were reaching that age where all of a sudden part support was getting hard and they had all the center barrel issues and, and all that other things. And, and maintenance got hard for the sea metal. All of a sudden their maintenance uh, hour per flight hour went way up huh. and the super Hornet was <laughs> like the new kid on the block. And all of a sudden they're great. Now, I don't know at some point they're probably going to get old and tired, but right now they're trucking and they're doing really well. So that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. you mentioned that call, uh, flight hours. I was amazed when I was, I got my safer flight and looking through it. Our, our uh, man hour per flight hour. When I first transitioned to supers, a lot 23s and 24s, I think we started out at 11. Oh, that's we awesome. Tomcats, it was 45. That's right. And that's a good squatter. That's, <laughs> that's right. I, but I remember the magic number being like 50. So yeah, that's that's about right. right. The yeah. funny thing is I re, when I was in 213 for that last uh, deployment, so it was uh, VF213 and VF31 and KG doing yeah. the last one. And uh, we had, uh, it, we actually, you know, every month you would report your, your, your numbers, right? What was that uh, report called? Uh, the uh, monthly. That's uh, not your, not whatever, your, whatever yeah. it was, that monthly report, we put the numbers out and people were calling us going, these can't be right. You know, I, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't believe that your, your maintenance, hour, your maintenance, uh, hours are so low because our maintenance hour per flight hour was actually less than some of the C models back home at Oceana. And people were like, no, that can't be. And we're like, it really is. <laughs> it was great. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, all right. Well, cool. Barry, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Nice to meet you. <laughs> you as well. You as well. Well, so what did you do? So you got out. Uh, when did you, what year did you get out? I got out in 97. 97. Then, What'd you uh, do after that? Uh, I started out as a financial advisor for American Express. And oh, I, no so kidding. Seriously. Then I hated it. And uh, so then I went to be a quality assurance guy and I worked, uh, that was kind of my career path for the next few years. Uh, I worked at General Dynamics and Raytheon um, as, a, as a QA guy. Doing a, it, it like for like AT world, like no, electronic no, 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 no. world. More, more, more. I have an MBA, so it was more managing people, managing budgets. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, that type of thing. So it had nothing to do. I mean, we worked on Navy stuff, but yeah. I had people and you know, my staff would QA it, and make sure it was good. Oh wow! Um, so we had like at the Norfolk Depot, Raytheon. We had Sea Sparrow and and Phalanx and uh, some Aegis stuff. But for my job is is more administrative. Um, but gotcha. then I, I'm also a reservist, so I had a parallel career as a res- I'm commissioned. Are you still in the intel. reserves right now? Yep, yep. I'm an intel officer. Uh, I'm in two and six for Maritime Expeditionary Security Group two in Little Creek. Oh, okay. 
Got as it. A reservist. So, and I did. I just did. I just got off active duty for like eight years. I was uh, working for uh, Naval Education Training Center, and then uh, OpNav, mm-hmm. and uh, did some Pentagon time, and then uh, just recently stopped that, and I'm back to being a reservist with a job. You know, parallel careers. Oh, gotcha. Awesome. Nice. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Go ahead, Barry. I just wanted to mention uh, Hornets. So I, as, as an Intel guy, one of my squadrons was VFC-12. So I was the Intel guy at VFC-12 at Oceana at Hangar 200 nice. for about, about three years, which is was pretty crazy. Oh, that's got to be some great flying for those guys, too. I mean, I, yeah. That's Jet right. Blue. They're, they're Jet Blue guys, a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. Well, cool. Well, well, guys, so we've had a great conversation here. Is there anything that you think we should have asked you, but we didn't? Mm. Not that I Nothing. Know. <laughs> Nothing. No, All right. Well, Go ahead. No, the only thing I did is like, uh, I, you know, we run in the camaraderie is what I really liked about being in a squadron and to this yeah. day, man, there's guys you call up and it's almost like we Barry talked about this running to somebody and it's like, yeah. remember when that was? Yeah. Dude, that was 20 years ago, you know? I, I was at the I was at the exchange uh, a few months ago and I was in uniform as a commander and I see this guy walking by and he's a beard and a, he's wearing a hat and I look at him and I recognize him from a guy in one-on-one in like the 90, early 90s. And I look at him and he looks at me and I'm like, Jason? It's like, Barry? Oh wow! And then we just like <laughs> thirty years the, later, all of a sudden it was like, "Hey, do you remember we went to Key West and this happened?" Or do you remember this? And like, this is like it was just we just picked right back. I haven't seen this guy in so long, and that's like what John said the camaraderie. And uh, I still John mentioned Bill Jockler, and uh, he was my housemate, and and uh, just just lots of friends from from the old days. And uh, and I still I'm on a, I'm a reservist commander, like I said, and, and I'll still tell people. Every chance I get, I was a Tomcat AT. And the other day we were having a, at my reserve weekend, we went out to have a few beers at this, at this brewery in Norfolk. And I was talking, you know, I just said that and this chief looked at me and he goes, Tomcats. That, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it was chief. Yeah, it was. Oh, well, that's funny. So, Here, it's, a, it's like, I'm enjoying it. I'm just, I, you know, I'm enjoying it. And, uh, I'm going to keep doing it until I stop enjoying it. That's great. So here's another thing about the camaraderie here in about three weeks, I got my Tomcat tour shirt. A a bunch of us, we're losing some master chiefs that we've known over the years for one reason or the other, but this is going to be our 27th year of going down playing golf on the Tomcat tour. Now we started out way back in the day, back in the early nineties, we'd go down to Myrtle beach. Now we're going down to, um, Pinehurst and I think the 20th anniversary we had like 72 people down there so uh, that was a good one and they get we got some f-35 guys from the you get guys from the program office we had guys from Jacksonville and um, guys from Oceana and we just kept it going over the years and it's just a really good time we go down there and reminisce and you know it's good times man John John's a hell of a golfer no not really (laughs) I don't know sometimes (laughs) <laughs> okay how good are you no nah, i'm only about a 10 right right now i could okay. get better we gotta practice and... the only way i ever break 100 is if i only play nine holes <laughs> <laughs> uh, well john what aside from playing golf what are you doing what keeps you busy now um i'm actually working at airland okay doing what um, um, I'm actually, believe it or not, a P3, EP3, MQ4 um, class desk. Oh, oh okay. And cool. I'm doing some stuff with the E6, too. They've been kind of busy lately, as you might think. But yeah, we yeah, won't yeah. ask you so, too much about that. Yeah. No, no. But um, yeah, I, actually, when I retired, I taught school for three years, believe it or not. Taught, What'd you teach? I teach, uh, I taught, um, I teach. That. You teach English. <laughs> I teach. I taught, <laughs> I teach English good. I was, <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. No, I taught introduction. You did to, teach good. Yeah. I, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe that's why I quit. No. Uh, <laughs> no, I taught intro to engineering and material science. At, and um, what grade? Um, nine through 12. Oh. I was at um, Lansdowne, the STEM Academy over there. Some nice. Really that's pretty cool. That's that's a that's an interesting subject. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah that'd be cool. Material it science. was good. But um, this job popped up at Airland. I really love it. I love, like I said, the camaraderie. A lot of the guys I used to work with, 
Um, and it's we're around airplanes every day. So, and you don't yeah. have to give anybody detention, right? So, I mean, right. Maybe. Yeah. Well, John, John would get in trouble if he called a student a fucking idiot. <laughs> They, they frown upon that, apparently. <laughs> yeah, apparently. That was when I found out John was teaching school, that's immediately what I thought. Was like, <laughs> I was pretty good. I, it's I, amazing. Yeah. I'm sure you were. Oh, okay, wow. okay, I'll be sure to check the block for language when, when okay, we Okay, sorry. sorry. <laughs> there you go. That, was, that was just for us. That was not for the audience. Oh, no, no, it'll be oh, left in. in. Oh, oh, it's in. It's in. <laughs> there are no edits. Everybody that knows John will appreciate the shit out of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh god go. i promise i promise i guarantee that all right crunch i think we i think we covered the waterfront here i mean you guys you guys i could tell from when we first started talking to you about being on here you you, you uh, had a lot of promise and you came on and you delivered you uh, provided a lot of good information so thanks yeah. thank you appreciate cool. it guys this has been great yeah. tell you what i'm gonna do uh well actually before i hit stop uh so gentlemen really really appreciate you being here and uh, really appreciate you being on the F-14 TomCast. And to all of our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned for the next episode coming up in two weeks. You've been listening to the F-14 TomCast, part of the Air Combat Experience, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at F-14TomCast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101, extension 3. That's 877-622-4101, extension 3. For updates on this podcast and our other military aviation theme shows, visit BVRPro.com and follow the Air Combat Experience on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks for listening.